Welcome to History of the Second World War, episode 128, The September Campaign, part 20, The Last Surrenders. This week, a big thank you goes out to James for choosing to become a member by supporting the podcast on Patreon. You can find out more at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. As soon as the German invasion of Poland started on September 1st, the countdown started on how long Polish resistance could continue. This timeline was then greatly accelerated when the Soviets invaded. Over the course of the first three weeks of the invasion, strong resistance continued in various areas of Poland. The Polish military did not give up easily. But during the last week of September, time simply ran out. In the last episode, we discussed the final surrender of the two largest cities that were still in Polish hands, Warsaw and Lwów. This episode will discuss the final pockets of resistance that would surrender to the Germans or the Soviets in the last week of September or early October 1939. Some of these areas were expected to be some of the final areas of Polish resistance, like Fortress Modlin north of Warsaw. Others were just groups of soldiers in eastern Poland who tried, and failed, to fight their way to neutral Hungary or Romania. And then another group may be the least expected, and this was the group of Polish defenders on the Hell Peninsula near Gdynia on the far northern tip of the Polish corridor. In all of these cases, the Polish defenders had only one choice— how long to fight before they surrendered or died where they stood. There were no other options. Fortress Modlin, situated north of Warsaw at the confluence of the Vistula and Narav rivers, was designed to be one of the strongest areas of Polish resistance. Fortifications on the site dated back centuries due to the strategic positioning of the confluence of the two rivers, the Vistula and the Narav. Over the 150 years before the Second World War, the site had seen multiple rounds of sort of defensive works put up. Napoleon's armies would build, uh, build up defenses against Russia, then the Russians would use it to defend against a possible German invasion, and then Poland became independent after the First World War, and it would once again put in a new generation of defenses for the same purpose. During the interwar years, both anti-tank and anti-aircraft capabilities would be added into and around the existing fortifications to protect them from new threats of, uh, that were now on the battlefield. After the German invasion on September 1st, all of this time and effort would pay off, as Fortress Modlin and its surrounding fortifications were an area that Polish units could retreat to after the Germans had pushed south from East Prussia. This would swell the number of defenders over time, and as the Polish defenses fell apart in other areas of the front, those troops in Fortress Modlin structured themselves to continue the defense from all sides. German air and ground assaults on the fortress would continue, but with many costly failures. Here is one Polish defender discussing a failed German attack on September 22nd. Quote, After a few minutes, the Germans attacked. We remained silent at first. The Germans must have thought that after such an intense artillery bomb barrage and with a possible shortage of ammunition, our crew was ready to surrender, but they were sorely disappointed. At the first burst from our light artillery squadron, our machine guns, which had only been waiting for that moment, exploded into a powerful song. I noticed that the Germans instantly dropped to the ground, many of them likely never to get up again. Our accurate gunfire did not allow the enemy to move forward even in isolated leaps. The barrage proved to be impassable. End quote. But no matter how well the Polish defenders of the fortress and its surrounding areas de- defended you know, their section of the front, By the last week of September, the sheer numerical advantage of the German forces was causing problems. As Polish resistance ended in other areas of Poland, more and more troops could be moved around the surviving pockets of resistance, and by the last week of September, there were five German divisions encircling Fortress Modlin. This fact did not immediately cause any change in the views of the commander of the Modlin garrison, General Tomei, because as long as Warsaw held out, it was beneficial for the defense of the capital for Fortress Modlin to continue in its defense as well. If Modlin surrendered, those five German divisions might move south to hasten the surrender of the capital. But then the decision was made in Warsaw to surrender to the Germans, to prevent further suffering among the civilian population of the city. And suddenly, the continued defense of Fortress Modlin no longer served any real purpose. This caused General Tomei to make the decision to begin negotiating with the Germans, with a Polish representative sent through the lines in the afternoon of September 28th. 
The terms that were presented were essentially the same as what had been given to Warsaw. Men had to lay down their arms, they would then later be released. There were only two Polish requests, that 3,000 wounded be cared for, and that food be sent to the garrison as quickly as possible, as they had essentially run out of food during the defense. No German guarantees were made on these two topics, just the word of the German General Strauss uh, that they would do what they could. The official surrender would occur on the morning of September 29th, when Tomei met Strauss south of Maudlin. With the agreement in place, all of the remaining Polish soldiers around Fortress Maudlin would turn themselves into German prisoners of war. So this is generally the part where I mention the number of soldiers who surrendered. And I would like to, but we have to talk about this for a second. With numbers like soldiers surrendering or casualty figures, numbers are often a bit fuzzy. It can just be hard to find precise documentation in many cases, even in a conflict as well documented and researched as the Second World War. Think of how many man hours have been spent researching and writing about the Second World War. But in this case, for the number of Polish soldiers who surrendered on September 29th, I see numbers ranging from 19,000 all the way up to 35,000 which is a pretty wide range. It's probably somewhere around there, maybe? Uh, doing some digging into each of these numbers, I kind of generally have tracked them back to archival sources that aren't digitized and that I don't have access to. So all I can really say is that it was probably somewhere between 19,000 and 35,000 Polish soldiers who surrendered, but that's about as specific as I can get, although I realize those two numbers are very different. While the troops defending Fortress Maudlin had a well-developed and very clear area to defend, and kind of a very clear end goal, for most other groups of Polish soldiers that were still fighting by the third week of September, the situation was far more fluid. The grouping of Polish units known as the Northern Front was one of these units. It was made up of most of five infantry divisions, some random bits and pieces forced into two infantry brigades, and then what was left of five cavalry brigades. Almost every unit was well below strength, and as the fighting continued, the numbers continued to decrease. The army was commanded by General Dab Bernaki, and he found it himself in a pocket of territory in eastern Poland between the advancing Germans and the Soviets. And the goal of the Northern Front was to move south as quickly as possible in an effort to make it to the Hungarian border. They would be joined by the remains of two additional cavalry brigades north of Tomasov Lubelski, which were under the command of a General Anders. They had to try and push through the German units that were already defending Tomasov Lubelski, which had in previous days already stopped the Polish units of the Krakow and Lublin armies who had been attempting to reach Lvov, uh, the actions of which we covered two episodes ago in episode 126. The Polish plans that were developed would see Anders attacking with his cavalry to the west of Tomasov Lubelski along the Wiepsz River. The larger number of troops of the Northern Front would attack north of Tomaszow Lubelski. The fighting would begin on September 21st, with the Germans being at least a bit shocked to see such a large and well-organized group of Polish units attacking them. This surprise was compounded by the fact that orders were already starting to circulate through German units that they needed to minimize casualties in any fighting to the east of the Vistula which was the territory that they were in at this moment, and it was also territory that would be handed over to the Soviets after the campaign. The Polish infantry found it impossible to push fully through the German defenses north of Tomasov Lubelski, although they would be able to capture a few Polish villages in their attacks. After the attacks of September 21st and 22nd, the Polish infantry divisions kind of just had nothing left to give, and Dab Bernaki would change into civilian clothes on the night of September 23rd and leave his men to their fate. On September 26th, about 6,000 men of two Polish divisions would surrender, while many other units would break into small groups to try and continue their move south. The exact fate of many of those groups is kind of impossible to determine. The cavalry units under Anders, who had attacked to the west of the city, were generally more successful with their attacks, um, mostly because it was mostly just luck, honestly. Uh, 
Anders just happened to attack into an area with few German defenders, resulting in the Polish cavalry finding their way into the command post of General Koch Irpak, the commander of the German 8th Infantry Division. The Poles then took the general captive, the first German general captured during the war. Anders would write that, quote, At 11 p.m. the enemy was defeated, the opening made, and the exhausted troops began to pass through the gap. While the Polish cavalry was able to continue south, they were also reaching the end or the limit of their endurance. Here's Anders again, quote, We had by now lost nearly all of our motor transport and had no petrol for what was left. We hissed our guns to four pairs of weary horses, which, lathered in sweat, pulled them slowly forward, end quote. On September 25th, Anders would hand over his prisoners, including General Koch or Pock, to some German units of the 18th Army Corps near Shimishal in exchange for letting the Polish units continue south. A good exchange for Anders. But then on September 27th, just 120 kilometers from the Hungarian border, a group of Soviet cavalry troops would be encountered who were not willing to negotiate. They would instead attack, supported by tanks and armored cars, that the Polish cavalry were not able to defend against. Most of the remaining Polish cavalry would be forced to surrender. Some, including a wounded Anders, would be able to continue south, but just 20 kilometers from Hungary, they would be captured. After the surrender of the Northern Army Group, two large groups of Polish soldiers remained in eastern Poland, although numerous smaller groupings of soldiers still remained at large. The two large groups were the roughly 8,000 troops under the command of General Orlik Ruckman and then the 15,000 troops under General Kleber. Much like the Northern Army Group, these units were only able to exist due to the pocket of territory that remained between the advancing German and Soviet armies, and they were running out of time. The two Polish groups were able to communicate with each other, and so they decided that they would try and combine their forces near the Polish city of Kowal. But they found that the city was already occupied by Soviet forces of the 5th Army. While still separated, Orlik Ruckman's group would be the first to encounter Soviet resistance, and after a few hours of fighting, he would have no choice but to order his units to break up into small groups and fend for themselves. Orlik Ruckman and a few other soldiers would be able to make their way north, eventually making it to Lithuania, but most of the soldiers that had been under his command would not be able to escape. General Kleberg would be able to survive a little bit longer. While most Polish generals were trying to get to a border with a neutral country to allow for an escape, Kleberg had different ideas. Instead of moving north to Lithuania or south to Hungary or Romania, Kleberg planned to move to the west, to Deblin, on the Vistula, roughly halfway between Lublin and Warsaw. From there, he would cross the Vistula River and move into the forested areas to the southwest. He would explain his plans to his officers like this. Quote, Warsaw has fallen. There is no point in going to aid the capital or carry out diversions. The only option we have left is small warfare, guerrilla operations that can be carried out in large forest areas. This war will prove that, in spite of everything, we continued to fight. End quote. This plan would be derailed when they met German troops north of Lublin. The Germans attempted to get Kleberg to surrender, but he refused, and there would be several days of fighting. The initial German attacks were repulsed, and the Polish forces would even be able to begin their own offensive operations. These attacks had some limited local success, but nothing that would change the wider situation. They were expending their last offensive strength to make incredibly small gains, with little chance of wider or long-term success. The Polish troops were running out of food, ammunition, and, and hope. Late in the day on October 5th, Kleberg would hold a meeting with his senior officers to discuss the situation. They saw little other option other than to begin the process of surrender, although Kleberg would end the meeting saying, quote, We have nothing with which to reproach ourselves. We have done our duty to the last, and in some time, when our country will ask us for an account, we shall be able to answer every question. Tell your soldiers that they knew how to fight for the honor of their fatherland, end quote. The surrender would come into effect at 4 p.m. on October 6th. Over 15,000 Polish troops would surrender at that time. Kleberg would announce the surrender to his troops with the following words, quote, Soldiers, I have gathered you under my command from the faraway Polsi, 
from the banks of the Narav, from the units that resisted demoralization at Kovel to fight until the end. You showed courage at a time of doubt, and you remained faithful to your country until the end. Today, we are surrounded at running out of ammunition and food. Continued resistance offers no help, but will only shed soldiers' blood, which could still be useful. It is a commander's privilege to take the responsibility for his decisions. Today, I take it at the hardest time, ordering you to stop further pointless bloodshed so as not to waste soldiers' lives. I thank you for your courage and obedience, and I know that you will take up arms again when you are needed. End quote. Kleberg's surrender would be the final large surrender of organized Polish units. While Kleberg's surrender was the last large surrender, I thought it would be appropriate to end this episode, the last before we start a wrap-up of the September campaign next episode, where the fighting started, in Danzig, in Gdynia, on the Baltic coast. The opening shots of the war had been fired in Danzig, and the defending Polish troops had been forced to surrender the city over the following hours as they were attacked by overwhelming German forces. The Polish defenders of Gdynia would be able to defend their positions for a much greater period of time. With the Polish defenders at Gdynia cut off from any possibilities of reinforcement, the area received relatively low priority from the Germans, and it would not be until September 7th that a real effort would be made to advance on the city. At that time, the 207th Infantry Division, along with some troops from Danzig, would begin pushing north against Polish resistance. The Polish troops of the Coastal Command would do all that they could to slow the German advance, especially in the forested areas to the south of the city between Danzig and Gdynia. But German artillery fire would slowly push them back into the north. Even with the artillery advantage, it was still slow going for the Germans, and it would not be until September 12th that the Polish forces would be pulled back to the north, to the outskirts of Gdynia. There they would be able to resist for another week, although it was a week of constant attrition due to attacks from the air and from German artillery. Polish troops would continue dying until September 19th, with some units reduced to just 10% of their original numbers when they were pushed back into the city or they surrendered. The commander of Coastal Command, General Dabek, would commit suicide after the Polish units had suffered around 4,500 casualties, with half that number being killed. On the day of the collapse outside of Gdynia, Hitler would arrive in Danzig to visit German troops there, mostly as a photo opportunity for propaganda purposes. He would meet with the sailors aboard the Schleswig Holstein, which had bombarded the city of Danzig and then had done the same against the defenders of Gdynia. Hitler would get his publicity photos among the shell holes and ruins of the defenses on the Westerplatte, but even at that very moment in which Hitler was celebrating a German victory, Polish troops were still defending positions north of Gdynia. These troops were on the Hell Peninsula, which is a 35-kilometer-long peninsula north of Gdynia that pushes out into the Baltic. A naval base had been built at the end of that peninsula, with a fortified area built up during the interwar years. There were heavy artillery emplacements and anti-aircraft batteries in this area, with the goal of providing defenses against the possibility of a German naval invasion. The defenses were not completed when the war started, but they still provided protection for the garrison of troops. The first German attacks on the peninsula would begin on September 11th, when the German troops of the 207th Infantry Division would reach the base of the peninsula, cutting off those on the peninsula from the mainland. The Germans would then spend the next two weeks slowly pushing the Polish defenders back along the Hell Peninsula. While the defenders of the peninsula were in a, in a tight spot, it would be challenging to design a more defensible area, with some parts of the peninsula being only a few hundred meters wide. The defenders were also able to round up some additional anti-aircraft gun from Polish warships and from warehouses in Gdynia before it fell to the Germans. These were important because the Luftwaffe would visit the peninsula multiple times in an attempt to put the Polish artillery positions out of action. Two old German battleships would also be called in to bombard the Polish defenses, but the German naval guns would prove to be largely ineffective. Hundreds of 28cm and 15cm naval shells would be fired at the Polish defenders, but these shells would have little real effect on those Polish defenders or the defenses in which they inhabited. The Polish artillery would also fire back at the German ships, although they would be similarly ineffective with their fire. With the attacks from the German artillery and, and ships and aircraft unable to really make an impact, and with the difficulties that the Germans would have in pushing ground troops onto the peninsula, the greatest problem for the Polish defenders 
became their own morale. After Gdynia was captured and after the Germans cut off the defenders from the mainland, just like we've discussed countless times for different groups around Poland, there was no real path forward for the defenders. By September 29th, the desire of some troops to surrender was growing, and on the next day the Germans would be able to finally capture the Polish defenses at Chalupi, which was about a quarter of the way down the peninsula and also one of the narrowest portions. While there were still many defenders on the peninsula, and, and, you know, it could be defended, the commander of the Polish defenders, Rear Admiral Joseph Ungrung, uh, began to consider surrender as the supplies and ammunition began to dwindle. Some units wanted to continue to fight, but there were limits to how long Ungrung would continue to order his troops to resist without any real purpose remaining for their sacrifice. On October 1st, he would make the same decision that other Polish commanders had made in similar situations and approach the Germans to request surrender negotiations to begin. A ceasefire would be agreed to, any sensitive documents were destroyed, and the official surrender document would be signed later in the day. 3,600 Polish soldiers and sailors would surrender to the Germans. They were not the last group to surrender, but their situation was perhaps the most hopeless. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next episode as we take a wider look at the September campaign as a whole and at the cost of the campaign 